This week we're going to be learning the final things we need to know about ionic compounds, but we will also be going over how to name covalent compounds and kind of what the difference between ionic and covalent compounds are, just briefly. All right, so before we can get started, I want us to just quickly review the differences between different types of ionic compounds that we've talked about so far. So we have normal ionic compounds which have main group metals in them and just what we've done for the past couple of weeks is we've found the charges of the ions involved in the compound balanced their charges and written the chemical formula for the compound um, this is the pretty much the same process that we're going to be doing for all formulas except once we get to transition metals and polyatomics there's only a slight uh, slight variations. So for normal ionic compounds an example would be uh, calcium fluoride. We would use the ion for calcium and the ion for fluorine to figure out what the compound should be. So Calcium being a group 2 element, we know has a 2 plus charge, and fluorine being a group one or a group 7 element has a negative 1 charge. To figure out what the formula would be, we would need for sure more fluorine because it only has a negative 1 charge in order to balance out the overall charge of the compound with this plus 2 charge over here. So we would need a total of 2 fluorine, or we can figure that out by just simply crisscross the way that we learned how to do in class this week, this past week. So we'll have calcium, and it would have a subscript of 1, but we don't write it, and then fluorine with a subscript of 2, CaF2. Okay. Um, finally, when we, or next, when we move to transition metals, the only difference is that the name will give us the name of the transition metal, which we should be able to find in either the D block or the F block of the periodic table, and it will also give us the charge of our transition metal. So an example would be Alright, I just made this one up. I don't know if it exists. Gold 1 oxide. So the symbol for gold is AU. And we know from the name here, this Roman numeral 1, that the symbol has a plus 1 charge. This Au is a plus 1 ion. Oxygen is a negative 2 ion, as we know from the periodic table being in group 6. So therefore, if we crisscross just like we did before, we can figure out what the compound formula should be. It should be Au2O. Alright, then finally when we get to polyatomics, if the name includes eight or ite, those are our common clues that it's a polyatomic ion in the name. So let me see, if we had barium chlorate, barium chlorate. Okay, so barium is a metal that we know has a plus 2 charge because it's in group 2. Chlorate is a polyatomic ion that you would have to find on the back of your periodic table. It's not just chlorine. It's ClO3, I believe, with a negative 1 charge. Alright, so if chlorate has a negative 1 charge, we need 2 chlorates to balance out this plus 2 from the barium. We can get the same thing by crisscrossing. Okay, so then we get one barium, Ba, and two chlorates. Now the only difference here for polyatomics is if you have more than one of your polyatomic ion, which in this case we're going to have two, we need to put it in parentheses. Don't forget that part. Okay, so chlorate, the entire chain, ClO3, we leave off the charge because it's in the compound now. We're going to put number of chlorates in the compound outside the parentheses. Remember this is like multiplying by everything inside the parentheses because we need two entire chlorates. Alright, that's our review of formulas. And 
just I, I'm not going to do these examples because I'd be overkill at this point. In reviewing, when we're naming a normal binary, meaning there's only two elements in the compound, ionic compound, we just end with the name of the nonmetal and ide. When we get to transition metals, we have to add that Roman numeral to show us the charge of the metal. And then finally, when we get to polyatomics, we're going to have to look up whatever the polyatomic ion is called to be able to write it in the name. If the polyatomic um, is a cation, we would write the name of the polyatomic ion first because the positive thing always comes first in the name. If it's an anion, which is more common, the polyatomic name comes next uh, in the second part of the name. But um, one comment I had about that uh, is that to figure out if a compound is polyatomic, you would see more than two different elements in the compound. So in this case, we have metal with nonmetals, but there's one, two, three different elements in the compound. So that means part of it must be polyatomic. So this whole thing is our polyatomic. Okay. All right. Now, moving on. Acids. These are L, uh, compounds that have typically hydrogen attached to some negative ion. Hydrogen or H plus ions are considered acids. And they usually are paired up with uh, negative ions. which is called an anion. Okay, so if we have what's called a halo acid, this is hydrogen, an H plus ion paired with some halogen. These are the group 7A elements, all the ones that have a negative one charge on the periodic table. Oh, I have that written right here, sorry. Okay. So an example would be if I had HCl. This is probably the most common acid you'll see. This is hydrochloric acid. And how we get that name is we use the beginning part, hydro, that stands for the hydrogen, the part of the halogen name, so chlor, we're going to use just chlor for chlorine, and then you end the name of the halogen, instead of it being chloric or chlorine, it becomes chloric. So it's hydrochloric acid. Okay. If we had H uh, B R, that would be hydrobromic acid. Okay. All right. Now all the other ones will that do not have halogens are going to be a little bit different because they won't have the hydro in the beginning. So if it's H plus with some polyatomic ion that ends in eight, we will use the ion name for the polyatomic ion and just change the ending of that to ick and then acid. So an example is H2 SO4. This is sulfate. Is this polyatomic ion? A sulfate looks like this. Okay, sulfate changes to sulfuric, so it's a, it's a little, little different than what we've seen before. Sulfuric acid. Some of these will become more familiar with it over time. Sulfuric acid is extremely common. All right, and finally, uh, if it's an ite polyatomic ion, like sulfite, this has a two negative charge as well, so this acid would be H2SO3. The name of this one is going to take the sulfite, change it to sulfura, so you take the sulfite and just end the ending to us, sulfurous acid. Alright, so that is naming acids. We'll be practicing that in class a little bit. This is just a brief introduction. You also have that information on the back of your periodic table. Okay.
Covalent compounds. Now, this is um, something we've kind of alluded to a lot, but with our group 4A elements, which have four valence electrons, we've kind of debated about whether they have a charge of plus 4 or a charge of negative 4, or are they neutral? And in general, let's assume that carbon is neutral. And so the question is, how can it get all eight valence electrons without becoming an ion? So without getting any new electrons, or without getting rid of all four of its electrons. Okay, the answer to this is it will find some other atom that has an electron that would like to get another electron, and they both kind of um, will pull on each other's electrons. And then pulling on each other's electrons causes those atoms to be stuck together. And this is actually kind of a strong force. This is what we call a covalent bond. You can think of it like sharing, but it's really more like they're both trying to take the electron from the other atom, but neither of them is strong enough to do it. Okay, so then... If it shares one electron with one hydrogen, now it has one, two electrons here that it's got near the carbon, but then it also has its other three. So now it has five electrons. The question is how could carbon get enough electrons to get up to eight? Well, it would have to share with three more other atoms. So let's say the three other atoms it shared with were other hydrogens. So it would be making a total of four covalent bonds, and that's actually really important. Carbon will make four bonds pretty much always because it only has four it only has four electrons and it needs to get four other electrons. And when you're covalent bonding, that requires you to form four covalent bonds. Alright, there you go, that's the drawing. It's not very lovely, but usually we would take this and we would draw this like this. Where the lines represent the bonds, the covalent bonds between carbon and hydrogen. And each of those bonds has two electrons per bond. Alright. Okay, so then um, if we look at the molecule I have drawn below, the just the formula here, NH3, what I would have to do is figure out how these atoms would be connected to each other. And we're going to start with nitrogen. Nitrogen has five valence electrons because it's in the uh, group five. And it has three hydrogens attached to it. Now, where should the hydrogen join up with the nitrogen. Well, of course, with all of its lone electrons, I would like a buddy to add up to a total of eight. So our hydrogens come along and make covalent bonds with our lone nitrogen atom. Our, our lone nitrogen electron, sorry. And now we have one pair right here that's not bonded to anything. We actually will call that a lone pair because it's all by itself. It's so lonely. And the, uh, when we normally draw the molecule, we're going to draw the lines for the bond. So finally, we would represent it with our lone pair still drawn as dots and our three bonds from nitrogen to hydrogen. This is the Lewis structure for the molecule ammonia. And the lines represent our bonds, the dots represent our lone pair. These are electrons that are not bonding. Okay, so the dots on the nitrogen atom represent electrons not bonded. Okay, the lines represent the covalent bonds. I don't know why I won't write my O's very well. Okay. So, when we're